start off by acknowledging that, that we're meeting on the traditional ter territories of the Blackfoot, Blood, Pagan, Stony, and Sarsi, and the signatories of the land of the signatories of the Treaty 7 region of southern Alberta, the Siksika, Pikani, Kainai, Tsutina, and Stony Nakoda. As well, the city of Calgary is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta in that region 3. With all of them, with, uh, with, with whom, with all of them, uh, and we as more recent inhabitants in these beautiful lands, now have the privilege of sharing the land together. So let me just give you a little piece about a pega. Um, it's our 100th anniversary. We, we've come up with the tagline, a century well built. And, and I think when we look back on it, um, we have engineers and geoscientists in Alberta have made a big impact for Albertans to, to make the play. Our, our mandate is, to, is, to, is public safety. So I, I think you'll agree that bridges don't fall down here. Um, rock slides don't occur when, when properly the geotechnically put together. Um, we found enough oil and gas to sink a ship and uh, yeah, all those kinds of things. We've done well for Albertans. The last century saw a lot of disruption and I think this digital age is going to see a lot of disruption in the future. Not, not, not in a put bad sense, but it's going to see lots of change. And that's what we're going to talk about today. A follow on to our century well built tagline is with trust, we can build anything. And I think all of us agree that, you know, a pega, pe people don't know who we are, what we do or why we do it. Um, and, and that's okay, they shouldn't have to. They need to feel perfectly safe going over the, uh, uh, the centennial bridges and, and, and those kinds of things. But it's, it's important, I think, that we actually spend some time in this next while telling people about what we do uh, and, and why we do it. We have a short video to uh, kick off our centennial year. So if we can get that up, thank you. First, a PEGA built trust. We built it with our membership, Alberta engineers and geoscientists. Then we built it with Alberta. That trust empowered professional geoscientists whose insights built our industry, whose curiosity taught us where we came from, and whose passion tells us where we're going next. That trust empowered professional engineers whose ambition brought us higher, whose ingenuity brought us closer, and whose perseverance made it all stand the test of time. That trust built Alberta. Because when you build trust, you can build anything. Here's to the next 100 years. Here's to the centennial anniversary of the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Alberta. Here's to a century well built. Thanks to our communications department. That's uh... so. A few more introductory remarks. At, at APEGA, we, we wonder how to regulate new technologies that will arise and new industries in and around what already exists, the energy sector, the agribusiness, and, and other sectors of the economy that are, gonna, that are going to develop. New research areas, new skills that are going to be required, and new trends in society like conservation, sustainability, those kinds of things. What will society look like in the future? It's workers and employment urbanization of the population seems to continue, infrastructure and transportation. So we've got three very distinguished guests here today to help us with this, and I'm going to introduce them. Disruption and opportunity in a digital age is our, is our topic today, a future that could be quite uncertain. First, I'd like to welcome Dr. Leslie Rigg, Dean of the Faculty of Science. Les is an internationally recognized scholar with over 25 years of experience working in a post-secondary education. Currently in her second term as Dean, Lutton for punishment, she's a forest ecologist by training. Leslie has a bachelor's degree in geography and environmental studies from York University, a master's degree in geography from the University of Colorado, and a doctorate 
in Geography and Environmental Studies from the University of Melbourne in Australia. Before coming to the University of Calgary in 2015, she was Vice President of Research and Innovation Partnerships at Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, Illinois. Please join me in welcoming, there she is. <laughs> Our next panelist is Bill Rosehart, PNG, the, the Dean of the G Schulich School of Engineering and an APEGA licensed PNG, obviously. Bill is a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering, named in recognition uh, of his commitment to innovation in teaching and learning. He's known for his research in electrical energy engineering. Under his leadership, school Schulich has transformed its research and teaching spaces started a new series of initiatives under, um, under, uh, under the strategic vision, Catalyst for a Connected World. This multi-year plan is focused on enhancing a global research impact, expanding access to engineering, and enriching the student experience. Bill is a founding member of the Canadian Engineering Education Association. Please welcome me, uh, help me in welcoming Bill. Our final panelist, Dr. Mohamed El Habibi, is an alumnus of both Schulich and Haskane schools and an entrepreneur. Mohamed is the co founder and executive vice president of Microengineering Tech and president of RoboGarden, both of which are located here in Calgary. He's bent on improving the, uh, the, uh, the employment rate here. He's a futurist, a goal driven business professional with a strong industrial experience and was named one of Avenue Magazine's top 40 under 40. Mohammed received his PhD in Geomatics Engineering in 2006 and an Executive MBA in 2017, both from the University of Calgary, obviously. He also won the 2015 Aztec Award for Outstanding Achievement in Applied Technology. Please welcome Dr. Habib El Habibi. So we're going to move directly to the, uh, the panel discussion. We actually had some time a, a, a week or so back to uh, a telephone conversation to sort of figure out how we were going to do this. Um, so we have a few questions prepared um, and, and hopefully they've got a few answers prepared. <laughs> but there'll be some, some on the fly as well. So the, the first question is uh, that the I have is, Building the professions of engineering and geoscience as the, as the world evolves is a top priority for everyone on this panel, obviously. And, and everyone in the room to come to that. So what, what are the universities, industry and, and professional organizations doing to prepare employees with strong digital and data backgrounds um, that they're obviously gonna need in a digital future? Um, maybe I can turn to you first. Okay, great. So, uh, pleasure to be here. Um, this is a great question, and um, like what you said, we're, every day in both companies we're thinking, what is next? Especially when you come from the small side of the business. Uh, before, for years, uh, it was about the domain knowledge. Actually, no, today is not about that, because knowledge is kind of more accessible. You can search, you can find more easily. So skills like creativity, innovative, critical thinking, and more important actually being flexible because what you used to be uh, a long-term career path and skills, I don't think it would be there anymore. You have to be flexible and almost flexible in real time. The last piece I would like to ask about this one that we all were thinking in our team members and our direction is decision making. Okay, decision making now are moving actually from the top of the company to almost everyone. When you're talking, when you're talking about real-time data and you're thinking that you have to really be agile, fast, and I'm sure everyone in your decisions, this is needs that people has to be ready or our employees, engineering, geoscientists to decision-making on the spot. And this is now moving from, like I said, domain knowledge to these soft skills, which is totally new. It looks easy words, but surprisingly, most of the engineers still need to be trained and work on this kind of environment. 
I don't think it's just the engineers, the geoscientists. Geoscientists they, also, yeah. They, 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 <laughs> these, these softer skills. I, yeah. Leslie. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll start with saying soft is hard. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and that's, um, but I, I think that, a, that from the university perspective, we have a responsibility in terms of um, upskilling and training our students in areas that we have been training them for a really long time, but we haven't been labeling it as such. And so we think about, you know, you said engineering and geoscience, and I think about what the, the, the thread that ties them together would be data. And so when we think about data science, what are we doing here um, at the University of Calgary to upskill, to train, to prepare our students for um, the industries that they're moving into and for the needs that we can project into the future that the students will have to have or the, the needs that they will have to serve. I used to ask students on the first day of the first year, you know, think about what you want to do when, when you leave this university. And I don't ask that question anymore because <laughs> we don't know, right? What we have to ask the students, are, what are the problems that you think are out there that you want to solve and what tools do you need to solve those problems? So we've implemented, and I know that, that Bill will talk about some of the programs in engineering, but in science and across the faculty um, and across the university, um, we are trying to instill digital knowledge, technology, um, data skills to all of our students. So we implemented a, a data science program. We have an information security program. And those are both laddering programs so that we can create a student who, has, who can come in, do a certificate, from any, a graduate level certificate, um, from coming in from any discipline. So we work with Haskane, we work with Cumming, we work with engineering, and so the, school, the students come in and they leave four courses later with a certificate. Then they can come back and do a diploma in an area of specialization, and we're moving to what we call a professional science-based master's. These are the kinds of sort of very applied, focused programs that allow students to go out there into any industry across Alberta and across the world and apply data knowledge-driven skills. And I think that's what's going to become essential, and that's our responsibility as a university. The last thing I'll say before I pass it off to Bill <laughs> is, um, and I know that you'll talk about this as well, that from our perspective, when we look at the audience and we say, okay, what do we need? Because we always have to tell you what we need. We need you to place our students into hands-on, uh, industry-driven co-ops and, and internships. You are the, you make our students amazing um, because you give them the experiences that will set them up for success. So uh, that's my request as I pass it off to Bill. So we'll pass it on to, to the Dean of the Schulich. So, yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it's a great um, question and a really important discussion. And really, I think I'll just be building on what Muhammad and Leslie spoke to. And one of the ways that I look at it, 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 it's what are we teaching our students in this new paradigm and how are we teaching and engaging with our students in the, in the new paradigm. And, and so we remember who, who has young children around them, either their own kids or grandkids or neighbors' kids or something like that, right? They are constant, that's amazingly few, by the way. Um, I should have <laughs> asked the question in reverse, who doesn't? Because there's always the hesitation to put your hands up. Um, the, the, the generation, which includes the students that we're getting in our undergraduate degree, and it probably changes somewhere in between, they grew up with digital technology. They are so familiar with self-learning. Um, our 10-year-old uh, son, as an example, we have a rule at home on school nights, you're only allowed to watch educational videos, but you can watch as much as you want, <laughs> all right? And, 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 and it's scary, we've had that rule for about a year and a half now, the impact you know, he, he's coming and he's talking one day about photosynthesis and the next day he's talking about why we don't call uh, meat from cows cow but beef and he relates it back to uh, an invasion of the Vikings and to France and it, it's, just, it's just phenomenal. So that sort of speaks to what Mohammed talked about. The information is out there. Right? You can take over parenting for me if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no thanks. Three is enough. Um, before I was here, I had to drive all the way downtown and back for one of the kids. Um, it, it, and so one of the big, big things when we talk about digital future and we talk about um, the digital skills we want to train our students with and lifelong learning, it's how we teach them. 
So if you look in the, the room next door here, that's one of our labs. And it is set up and designed to allow for team-based, project-based learning, right? And, and so when the students are learning things, when I went to school, it was largely scripted lab type assignments. Do this, do that, do this. Now it's to instill lifelong learning, to, to help students learn how to learn. They'll get something, design this. Here's the equipment in the room, here's the materials in the room. And so by taking that approach, students learn um, a lot more ownership of their, of their own skills. So the knowledge is there, but they learn how to continually learn. And, and presumably, Bill, this is done in a, in a, in a team situation, because that's how you're going to work. A absolutely. And Leslie talked about the importance of interdisciplinarity. So when it comes to teams, we actually partner with the Department of Psychology. Ah. And we have one of their research labs work with us on how we train our students to manage team skills. Now, if we switch really quickly to what we got to teach our students, you know, um, I think every student at university anywhere needs to graduate with some degree of at least comfort with digital technology. So understanding the basics of IoT and sensors to understanding what's meant by data all the way through to at least having a concept of things like machine learning, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality. In engineering, we've launched a few initiatives. The first thing that we did is we uh, developed the Masters of Software Engineering, but we designed it specifically for students that didn't have a software engineering background. So think of it as a one-year boot camp that at the end of the one year, you have knowledge of undergraduate software engineering plus uh, graduate level software engineering. We've then launched this year uh, a minor in digital uh, engineering, and that's for undergraduate students from any of our programs. And the thing that we're now looking at launching next year is a digital spine. So that means every one of our students will get exposure to the key elements of digital technology as part of their undergraduate degree. And so in, in that kind of sense, that future is already here. Mm -hmm. the, the future needs to be here. And um, I had a busy morning. So one of the things that I was, I was on a conference call at 5 a.m. with a group of global deans. And uh, unfortunately, a topic of the conversation was the coronavirus. And two of the deans that were on the conference call were from China. And so they were going in and explaining how in their schools they've been actually teaching their courses online. And so when we think about um, technology and how it can enable, uh, one of the deans was saying attendance is actually higher and the students are really enjoying it. Um, and, and, and so that speaks to um, the need to transition. Right? You've got to teach the fundamental skills so they can absorb the different types of knowledge. Right? You can't just say, go watch a bunch of YouTube videos. It has to be a curated experience so that you can develop those fundamental skills. My opinion is you need to transition from traditional classrooms to more of what you see going on in that room there. Take, take the traditional classroom stuff and move some of it online to your YouTube type videos or other types of experiences. And then as Leslie said, uh, work integrated learning, which is the buzzword for things like uh, internships and co-op programs, absolutely essential. We've seen a 60% increase in the number of students placed in paid 12 to 16 month internships in our school over the last three years. Our goal is that every student will graduate with an opportunity to have had some type of meaningful work integrated learning. And so to help balance that, we've now started something called our engineering career practicum, which for students that don't want to go out for the whole 12 months, 16 months, that we're offering support to find two four month uh, co-op type experiences for our students as well. So as Leslie yeah. said, absolutely essential uh, part of the learning experience. Yeah, we've, we've done the same thing in the Faculty of Science. It's created those, those opportunities so that students can be flexible. And we used to have very specific programs and we got rid of all of them and made a faculty-wide internship and co-op program. So I, that I think that getting out into industry exactly. is so important. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, Obviously, there are going to be some incredible opportunities presented as new digital technologies evolve. Um, 
Where are some? Of, I'm going to start with with you again. Where, where are some of the most exciting new technologies that you, you see or, or foresee being developed? Yeah, this is a very tough question. <laughs> That's why I gave it to you. <laughs> yeah, go, go in this order. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, if you Google what is the trend, the technology trend, most probably get a very long list. But the question when you tie it to industry, because I'm sure everyone is aware, economy globally is not doing well. So the problem now that technology actually is not connected to growth, simply the hog stick that everyone is looking for, for GDP. So we, we believe from a small company perspective that multi-experience technology is the key for the future. So VR by itself or AR or 5G connectivity being fast uh, AI is a kind of not an industry by itself. The experience that you can enable an engineer geoscientist can do an added value to it, to these multi-experience technologies is where we see the trend. And this is why 10 years ago, most probably when there is an app going out in Apple Store, Google Play, most probably everyone is using it. Today is not like that. Every day you have millions of apps, and actually these are millions of companies, millions of new ideas, new technologies. The, the winner, and we always, I mean, we think about the one winner is the one with the best experience and how to tie the multi-experience technology with that. I'll give an, uh, about, again, the experience and the shift. And I love what Bill said about the China and that, the attendance. So we were planning from our educational company to start in China last month. And guess what? We came back on January 20. It's almost a month now, so everyone's safe. Nobody has to run. <laughs> <laughs> so, and two days after, it was the outbreak of the coronavirus. And when we designed the experience in China, all our partners there, including Education Institute, said it has to be in the class. And we were trying to convince them it's better to be online, scalable. Anyway, so now suddenly everything is changing because students are staying at home, teachers are staying at home, and there was a big shift. So we went online and within one month we have 10,000 students. Wow. Okay, one more thing. Our, here the government start talking to us about, because we have a kind of joint work between Alberta and Zhejiang, we are looking for a coronavirus content, okay, that go everywhere. So we were able actually last week to create the coronavirus, how to protect yourself, how to make sure that you're safe, and we're releasing this today, and I think it's used in China. Okay, and it's coming out in Chinese, interesting. We're hoping to do it in English. So what I'm saying, the shift of the, this is again an experience because the, you have an access to, again, online cloud service. You got the positive experience. Now you're ready to attend. You're ready to use. You're ready to receive more knowledge. And it's immediate. And I mean, it's you're immediate. reacting to something that's important. 100%, yeah. 100%. So coming back again to the question, multi-experience technology. Whenever there's a positive experience, there will be a success to the technology and there will be a trend, users, growth, and then the chain itself is complete. So at risk of um, going on forever, Bill, um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna mix it up a little. Yeah. So, so what are the most interesting um, things that I think are gonna happen due to digital technology? Um, number one would be uh, more interdisciplinary opportunities. Yeah, it's, yeah. And Leslie uh, started to speak to this in the, in the first question. Uh, we're we're going to see more people working together because the digital technology can bring them together. And there's example after example of that happening. For example, in our uh, pipeline engineering uh, center, uh, we have a collaborative project that's going in for funding right now. It has people from mechanical engineering, it has people from civil engineering, electrical engineering, and also computer science, which we haven't traditionally seen. Uh, computer science and that particular project is bringing in expertise around visualization, artificial, I mean, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, the second piece I would say that is really exciting is access. So I, I'm a firm believer that education is absolutely key. And we think about access to education and how digital technology can change that. With my phone, I can look up just about anything on any topic. And done in a curated way, 
the number of people globally that we can give access to a stronger K-12 education and then university education, including uh, elements of professional degrees, uh, is phenomenal. And that's going to be a, a major game changer uh, globally, in, in, uh, in my opinion. And in, in the third part, I would say, and this is in a way holding us back to some extent right now, is how we connect technology to people, mm -hmm. right? Uh, some of the things that we're starting to see now from a technology point of view, we knew how to do a couple years ago. And so getting better at understanding the ways to interface and um, also get uh, um, people to adopt and feel comfortable uh, with technology. On the CBC radio this morning, they were talking about, I think it was in Windsor, that people can install cameras around their houses and the police can, if they're trying to figure out, you know, say there was an incident of some type near your house, that they can ping your camera, you get a little message, are you gonna let the police see the video? And if you say yes, the police get to see videos of what happened in the neighborhood. And so learning to be more comfortable with technology and understanding those balances between uh, what technology can do and uh, privacy, I think will be uh, really important. Thank you. So I think Mohammed and, and Bill have really covered most of the big um, tickets. And so augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, quantum computing, I think hasn't been mentioned. Um, and, and all the technologies that can sort of spin out of quantum um, physics generally. Um, we think about cloud computing, fog computing, all of those different kinds of technologies. And I, you know, I keep thinking back to when I was younger, much younger, and I was watching Star Trek and what, you know, it was sort of a window to the future and some of these, you know, my, my cell phone is really a tricorder. Um, and when I talk to Alexa, it's like I'm talking to computer. See, my phone activated. It's like, what do you want? Um, so <laughs> I think that we, we, um, when we think about what's coming out of the universities and we think about the technologies that are being developed, it's really mind-blowing. Bill mentioned the humans, right? <coughs> the um, and that connection to humans. So when we think about human-computer interaction, um, we usually typically think of what we're working with in terms of the robots or the, the technology. But we really do have to start paying attention to the humans as well, how we interact with technology. Um, and so we, do, we have a whole lab that, that looks at that. And we have a big robot called Baxter. And Baxter and the humans, we, we look at what the humans are doing and how we interact and how we respond. Um, but I, I want to come back to the theme of connectivity as well. Um, and you know the, the notion of coronavirus, because that's the topic of the day, um, and it's a huge one. It turns out that um, there's some researchers out of the University of Guelph, and this was just in the news yesterday. They were able to troll social media, particularly Twitter, and they can actually identify an outbreak, an outbreak two weeks before it actually is an outbreak. Um, so they're looking at images and statements online, and they can use technology to synthesize that and analyze it and, and actually pinpoint the location of the outbreak um, weeks before uh, the CDC or the World Health Organization can do the same. So that what we can do with technology is pretty amazing. I think about one of the, the people who are in one of our um, main researchers in computer science, he worked with the Alberta Electricity Grid, and what he and his students did was they created a virtual tech, instead of, you know, if you think about, I think about Simpson, uh, the Simpsons and Homer sitting at the nuclear control panels, and so all those panels there, um, those are tens of millions of dollars in any facility to put in. And what this team has done is created a virtual reality heads-up display where they can work with people around the world, electricity grids around the world, and talk about what they're seeing and actually manipulate um, electricity grids virtually. And so it's for tens of thousands of dollars instead, instead of tens of millions of dollars. So there is, you know, as you say, an economic impact to technologies, but also there, there are leaps that we can't even envision. And so technologies get used by creative students. We have one student who has a virtual reality heads-up display where he can dive into the solar system and explore exoplanets. Um, and so we have the virtual walk-through brain for healthcare. Um, we have, it's, it's just, it's curiosity sparks discovery. And the discovery um, through technology is what we can't even imagine. And that's, the, that's what comes out of the universities right now when we're working hand in hand with industry. It just, it creates something that we can't even envision. 
That, that, that leads right into my, my next question, I think. Um, this has been described as the sort of fourth industrial revolution, the, the, tech, the, the uh, technological revolution, um, and it's underway. So, so what trends are you seeing in people's lives uh, and uh, the jobs that are being changed and so on, but, but also uh, uh, is there developing a, a gap between those, those people who are, who, who are um, just not getting any of these digital skills, these technological skills, and we've, are we likely to see a, a sort of break in, in, our, in our population with those who are, have the skills and those who don't? Uh, but so first of all, sort of, what kind of things are changing? What kind of jobs are changing? And with with this artificial intelligence and machine learning and so on. Um, can I start with you? Sure. Yeah. So th th this is a great question, and this is coming to. Uh, I love uh, when you mentioned the future is here. Okay. So in the old days, to get to to just design this and get production, it was a, a big story. It's a, a big supply chain. Now with all the technology with the network, 5G coming, which is be faster, 3D printing, design tools that are very accessible and easy, everyone can personalize his own thing. So the whole industry and the skills are moving now to massive customization and personalization, not at the company's level, actually more at the individual level. Okay, and these, this requires a lot of skills because in the old days you, have to, you can do the same repetitive job for most probably three, five years before you're introducing one new more skill or information. Today, with everything we discussed, okay, actually everyone can customize and introduce his own product for himself and actually for the market. So being flexible and ready and integrate everything we discussed today on a personal skills is very important for the next future. Your question was great about the gap. Yeah. Okay, the gap is there, but uh, we, we, we did last summer with Epega this kind of uh, initiative that we have actually 27 engineers and geoscientists that kind we picked them they're away from technology and they're looking for a shift and when you start with things organized focus on a goal okay clear break down and start building the momentum actually everyone is catching up if you're talking even but again they are geoscience engineers great domain background if you move to another layer of people who has actually far away even from this, you still, there is, there is a role for them because creativity, when they understand the tool, not the mass behind it, not the technology behind it, the tools, they can start introducing and contribute for this kind of personalization and customization I mentioned in the beginning. I, I, um, I dabble in painting as well and, and I've noticed now how many, how many artists are using technology and putting it into, the other side of their brain or whatever they're doing. Um, do you have some comments, Leslie, on, on this topic? Uh, so on the notion of a gap, I find that really interesting. It's a, it's a great question. Um, I'm a glasses half full person. So what I, I see is that the gap is actually going to be um, addressed by the technology and that the technology is allowing us to shrink the gap. Um, and so we're creating greater connectedness. I think, Bill, you mentioned that. Um, you know, what a great an example that pops into my head when we were talking about sort of global changing, as Bill, as you mentioned, changing the global education landscape. Um, we have, most of you probably know that the University of Calgary has one of the best observatories in the world just south of us at the Rothney. And the Rothney has automated telescopes. So we don't actually, students don't have to be at the telescope anymore. They can connect it, they can operate it remotely. But one of the most amazing things that's going on right now is we have students in China who are working at a university in China with their professor and students working with our professors here at the University of Calgary. And they work together 24 hours a day operating the telescope and sharing data and working on projects together. Mm. I think that when we, when we envision what our, and what our gaps might be, and we're really talking more to, not to presume, but this crowd, right? Like the us and older, um, the students of today, there are, are no gaps. Um, yeah. they, are, they come in more prepared than we will ever be. Um, so what, can, what are the technologies that can accelerate our learning, can accelerate our access? And I really truly believe that technology, digital training, data science, all of the things that we're talking about today are narrowing that gap faster than we, can, than we actually acknowledge. 
Um, so I, I really do think that it's one of the great levelers um, that these technologies will. That, that's so good to hear, because I, I, I get concerned about this society sort of breaking apart into those who can and those who don't. Bill, Bill um, do you have some comments to add to this yeah. particular topic? The joy of going last is you get to say, I'm just going to follow up on what they spoke about. <laughs> so Leslie's glass is half full. I'll say I'm a glass mostly full uh, uh, type of person. And, you know, we've certainly seen in Calgary, you know, the need to look at transitioning and diversifying um, what we do and how we do things as well. And so that's why we've seen a lot of our energy uh, companies looking at digital technology in terms of how it can Im improve efficiency and operations of their business. Um, uh, who remembers punch cards? Okay, so I got more hands there than I did in my earlier question, right? <laughs> so in the lifespan of one career, we went from punch cards to iPhones to Siri to Alexa somehow working on an iPhone over here. That was your example. This is, yeah, the Alexa this, is the, actually in my house. There we go. Um, and it, the, we're used to change. Yeah. You know, the other yeah. example is who remember doing their taxes back in the day where the government, you'd have to go get one of those fill, fill in brochures, right? And so here, everybody, horrible experience, right? <laughs> like, like, absolutely horrible experience. So in comes personal computers. There was concern about how that's going to impact jobs and, and these things. And really what it did is it created a new industry. So instead of me spending four hours trying to fix all my mistakes on my taxes in that very painful form, which should have been simple, right? It's addition and subtraction and the occasional multiplication. <laughs> uh, now I, you know, it went from downloading a program to doing it on the web, and this year I'm doing it on an app on my phone, I think, is the, is the plan. And, and so digital technology will create different types of opportunities. It won't create less opportunities. Uh, what I think we will see is very repetitive types of jobs will go away. And I personally don't think that's necessarily a problem. It means the types of jobs that we will have are going to involve more collaboration, more creativity, um, and, and much more interesting. I think they'll actually be uh, more of a fulfilling experience than, than some of the types of work that we've seen in the past. Uh, remember the movies from you know, the 20s and 30s of the accounting companies. So you got desks after desks and everybody's sitting there with some type of adding machine. Uh, it's a good thing we don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> and so um, now the challenge is, for some people, there's a transition. And I think that's where is if you look at the post-secondary education as a whole, you're seeing lots of different type of entry points. You're seeing on one side, uh, for example, here at the University of Calgary, our continu continuing education uh, unit on campus, offering short training opportunities to give people a little bit of a bump and a little bit of a new skill set. And so maybe an example of that would be you're, you're really good at facilitating teams, but you don't really understand some of the digital technology. You take a couple week course there and that will allow you to open up some doors. Uh, we've got some of the laddering graduate programs in, uh, in our faculty of science for people that want to take a little bit more of a deeper dive on the data science side of it. And then in engineering, we've talked about some of the things we're doing in software engineering. So the trick, I think, in terms of uh, transitioning more people, uh, especially the people out in, the, in their careers already, is offering a host of types of opportunities to support that. But my feeling is the types of opportunities and careers created through digital technology are actually really exciting and less of the repetitive type of work but we do need to support transition. Thank you, thank you all. That was, I, I, I really struggled with that gap piece and I, and I see this sort of filling it right in actually, uh, now that I, not that I think about it, now that you've thought about it. <laughs> um, we, we hear the term um, big data and so on and, and, and thinking big. 
Um, if you put your futurist hat, hats on for, for a moment, what do you think the single most impact is going to be, impact social change, societal change that you expect to see from the, the, the digital technological revolution? Um, maybe I can start with you, Leslie. Sure. Um, so I might take us, not, it's not really a different, on a different track because I think we've been speaking to it. I would say the biggest impact that we're going to see of the digital revolution is inclusivity. And what I mean by that is, is a lot of what we've already said. Um, we are going to be able to accommodate more flexible working schedules, more connectivity across the globe. Um, we are looking at, there's a whole group of technologies called diversity and inclusion technologies in HR in terms of analyzing um, biases that we have or biases that we have when it comes to, say, ap the application process. Um, changing the way we work and think and who gets involved. Um, so just for an example, we were talking about apps. Um, there's an app called Be My Eyes, and Be My Eyes is a, for people who are visually impaired, and so I'm a member of Be My Eyes, and if somebody is in northern Saskatchewan and their uh, seeing eye dog has been spooked, they call me, and I, it connects straight to me. I've got their phone camera, and I can walk them to the stairs of their house, um, and then I go back to my meeting. And so there are so many technologies which are enabling all aspects of society, all groups to be included and involved in a way that we haven't been able to before. Inclusivity is going to be the greatest impact and it will have, it will have a tenfold impact on output because the more people we bring to the table, the more curiosity, the more creativity, the more ideas that come to the solutions, and it is going to have, it is a revolution in my opinion, in how we will solve the problems of the future. And so technology is the great leveler, and I truly believe that. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm passionate about that. And I, I really, really think that it- Not that, that we it, can tell. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, all of the programs that we put in place, technology is going to change the way we work together. It changes that connectivity, and it will be an inclusive leveler. Bill, do you want to add to that? Because you're, you're always talking about the, the sort yeah. of groups. And uh, absolutely. Um, you know, completely agree. Um, and we talked earlier about um, the gap and the fact that technology itself, if we think about K-12 to education, um, you know, it, 10, 15 years ago, one of the issues were uh, children in uh, less privileged areas than we are in Canada uh, didn't have access to school books, right? Couldn't work at night because they didn't have access to uh, light. Uh, and, and now we think about it, the, you know, the problem was you had computers, but computers were, we were not seeing the mass deployment of computers globally, but handheld devices. Uh, the number of people globally that have handheld devices, yeah. phenomenally. And so when we talk about access to education as one example, uh, the opportunities are endless in terms of where we're going to go as a global society and how that will drive the global economy. The other area that we haven't talked about yet, which I think will be a really interesting game changer, is medicine. So we had the Star, <clears throat> sorry, we had the Star Trek example. Right now, I think we are really just on the cuff of how digital technology is, is going to impact uh, medicine. So right now, if we're not feeling well, you go make an appointment with your family doctor, they ask you a bunch of questions and they take a bit of a guess, right? Uh, they, I mean, they're trying to check things off. They might send you for a blood test. If something comes back, they might come and say, you might take another appointment and they say you got to go see a specialist. You wait a year to see the specialist. The specialist says you've got this. You wait another year to maybe get an operation. Imagine what digital technology can do. That's Imagine not a very positive view of healthcare. <laughs> it's better here than most places in Canada. Um, and, uh, but imagine what digital technology can do. That, and, and just think about the changes. It's not just about the data, it's the sensors too. That you can put a couple sensors on your body and you can keep track of how your heart's doing. Right? And yeah. you can detect things long in advance. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I have one. I'm just not very good at wearing it. Um, but it's not just here, right? You can put something around your, your ankle. You can, you know, and, and you think about more complicated um, types of scanning or monitoring. You know, year by year, we're seeing smaller, less expensive technology that's available um, that's going to revolutionize uh, healthcare for us. And I think that's going to be a huge, huge uh, change into the future, and it's mm -hmm. going to be really good for everybody. Just, just to comment on that, my doctor, now we have a good relationship with my physician. And you did and, it before? And, and he understands that, one, well, no, he understands that I'm going to research what I think, I, what, what's happening to me before I go in there. And so he can give, us, give me a much better um, understanding of, of, of yes. because I, you can do some research online, and yeah. it's just great. I, I, I'm going to uh, turn to the... To I the, often refer to Dr. Google. Yeah, yeah. And, that, uh, I'm that's, sure I know what my doctor thinks of Dr. Google, but nevertheless... I, my doctor's pretty, pretty good about it. He, yeah. he knows that I'm going to do that. We've been talking to the educators. Let's just turn to the industry side and see... Yeah. So, the future. Yeah. The way I see it, I see super smart society living in smart city. So when you get these two together, this is an opportunity. And I agree with Bill and Leslie 100%. It's not actually only a challenge, it's a big opportunity. I will give an example on even how designs are happening from my experience UFC. First time I moved to Canada and my first steps was an e-building here. When I got a scholarship to do my PhD, I still remember this red bricks, no light, super dark. <laughs> Printing a big map, okay? And asking, where's geomatics department? <laughs> Okay, and keep walking and so on. I was happy then with this because I came from a hot country, I'm originally Egyptian, so this is protecting me from the cold then. <laughs> but when I see today, in the morning I came through an interactive map. It's my first time here. Th the design here, this is a multi-purpose space. It's not actually a theater or a dedicated one. Natural light means green efficient. This place is smart, okay? And when you move here to the older technology, all the digital changes, also the society will be smart. It's a massive opportunity. When you have the knowledge with great access accessibility to it, when you have the tools, and I love what Bill said about supporting the transition. This is very important because once you move from the beginning, where actually there's a lot of drops there and issues, and you start getting the skills, then you're ready to be within this smart society. So the way I see it in the future is taking all this technology to get things better. Smart cities are not a big topic, I'm sure, in the School of Engineering and <laughs> others working on it, but also smart society that are able to contribute and do added value to the robotics because robotics will do the repetitive work, and you heard this a couple of times. But humans will be always doing the added value, and this is, comes to the skills and how you are really ready for the digital future. That's cool. I like, I like the idea of uh, having somebody else do all the drudgery in the robotics and the, uh, yeah, thinking of the new things. Um, we, we're running out of time and I've still got other questions, but I, I, I want to open the a question Q&A period up to the audience. Um, you've heard a lot of discussion here, so raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. There's one at the back there. Hi. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, uh, thank you for uh, for this great event, this great discussion. Um, it is it is hard to talk about data and technology uh, without talking about uh, privacy and security, and uh, especially that uh, Muhammad Habibi talked about uh, like uh, being in this business in in Canada and the U.S. and in China, and we have we 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 know that the the um, uh, privacy and security regulations are different between those countries uh, to societies. And uh, the, the importance of the discussion about security and, and privacy is, is, is very uh, uh, particular here in, 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 uh, in Alberta because... Do you have a, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, I, I, want, I want to comment on the privacy and security because this is one of the yeah, biggest yeah. barriers for for uh, oil and gas companies to deploy and implement uh, technologies related to data and uh, cloud computation and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, okay. So I think, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a, great, a great comment. 
Um, and I think that across the campus, we have a lot of teams that are working on the notion of information security. So we have a, we actually, we talked about those laddering certificates that um, various units are doing. We have one in information security. So we have uh, lots and lots of researchers that are working with industry directly on, um, you know, from quantum computing and what that means for privacy to even the apps that you download. We have a researcher that's looking at the apps that are on your phone and what they're doing in the background that we aren't even aware of what kind of information they're collecting. So until we can understand what that chain of privacy looks like and the depth and breadth of um, making sure that the data is secure, the information is secure, and that privacy can be maintained, um, that is a, a crucial step. And I think there are um, there is expertise in Calgary if we combine some of the industry partners that we have with Cisco and others um, and the work that's going on. We are one of the global leaders, and I'm not just saying that. We actually are. Um, and so it's a really good place to be, and we need to make sure that those connections and that that information is, is available and um, that the industries who are in Calgary are accessing the expertise to help them ensure and, and um, encrypt and encode and um, make sure that those privacy chains are, are secure. It's good to hear that coming from the Dean of Science. Um, <laughs> from the industry point of view, do you have a comment? There is a lot, yeah, there is a lot of regulations now. And coming back, for example, to China and Canada. Canada, you have to host you the data of the users in a Canadian server. For example, China, the same. China, the government has to have access to the data. So if you talk about our solutions in Canada, we're in Montreal, our servers. In China, it's Aliba Alibaba Cloud in China. And you have to follow this regulation carefully because if there is a data breach, the consequences are massive. So this is a kind to be, have be, be very protective when you're thinking about it from an industrial point of view. Any more? Uh, this lady right here in the front. Um, so, sorry, <laughs> I'm not used to using a microphone. I, mean, I usually have a really loud voice. <laughs> so, uh, my question actually comes to the systemic and organizational disruption. So, an example for me, for like per on a personal side, I applied for a PhD in the, sc the School of Engineering um, just like a couple months ago, and I was required to get a paper copy of my transcript mailed to the university. So, um, as somebody, in a, as an engineer, I was is absolutely shocked. <laughs> so, um, so I'm just curious what is happening at higher levels, whether it be in industry, um, to address those systemic uh, like, um, challenges in the disruption? I'll let Bill answer that. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. Um, it, it, it's a great example, and it, in a way it relates to the, the first question as well, is it's not just all about the technology. We, we need to think about, for example, um, public policy, right? We need to think about organizational structures uh, to make the right people understand and feel comfortable with um, uh, technology options. I, I, I completely agree. I mean, um, when we talk about bringing the world together through technology, you, you pick the language. I can take my notes, take a picture of it, and get it translated yeah. into pretty much any language we want. We still require transcripts to be officially translated. I, I can do it online in minutes, right? And, and so it's, it's a matter of building the systems and the confidence in those systems. Uh, one of the ones that myself and one of our uh, uh, former dean colleagues who's a political scientist, we had a, a panel discussion last year talking about technology and elections. And my view is, when are we going to start voting by our apps, right? Like I can log in and do all my banking and uh, no offense to concepts of democracy, I actually consider my banking more important than my vote. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so if I can do my banking on my phone, when am I going to be able to vote on my phone? And imagine what that might do to a voter participation, right? It, it takes you minutes, not an hour. Um, but right now, we're not comfortable with that. We know the technology would enable that. Um, so to your point, sorry about mailing in the transcripts. <laughs> I'm not even sure where I would find my transcripts. Um, we will get there, but I think it is one of the ones, and you, you spoke to industry, and I think it's, 
institutions need to take a lead, government needs to take, to take a lead, uh, and corporations need to as well. So when we talk about data, we need corporations to be saying, we need standards, right? And, and, and sometimes it's not about more data, it's about the quality of data and getting the data when you need the data. And so uh, broader education in the area, especially around decision makers and policy makers. I, I spent uh, last week at Engineers Canada in, in Quebec and, and, and the qualifications board and the accreditation boards. And, and there are folks who are looking at those that have stacks of paper on their desks. And I was thinking, oh God, it would be so much easier if we just sent them the damn things. Maybe they look at them, which is speed up the process. Uh, we've got time for another question. Um, let's take the one at the back and then we'll come back to you, Melanie. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, okay, well, Melanie got the microphone <laughs> first, so we'll do that one. <laughs> Um, with so much access to information, I'm right here. Oh, sorry. I'll stand. <laughs> with so much access to information, this is maybe more for the educators. Do you guys see a uh, devaluing of post-secondary degrees? You know, there's there's been a trending downwards for a bit about the number of post-secondary degrees that are awarded, and also um, how do universities remain competitive with all this access to knowledge? Good question. So we are, uh, we're dramatically up in terms of the number of students that are uh, coming into the uh, Schulich School of Engineering compared to five years ago. Uh, I think that's partly changes is partly related to demographics. So if you look at some regions in Canada, there's actually less kids in high school. Uh, Southern Alberta doesn't have that problem. We have a fairly uh, a healthy youth, set of youth coming through. I think what we're gonna see is, is uh, a great opportunity for change in post-secondary education as you move away from uh, universities are keeper of the knowledge, right? So you come and you get the privilege of listening to your professor uh, right on the chalkboard. And I still do actually like chalkboards, but that's <laughs> besides the point. Um, it's going to be a much more interactive, immersive experience. So you'll see a shift away from uh, teaching in classrooms to one of the things that we're doing in our second year electrical engineering, we've developed a stream called ILS, Integrated Learning Stream, where we've taken the lectures, the tutorials, and the labs, and we teach everything for all five of their courses in one design type studio. Well, they'll have a little bit of a talk on a subject, and then they'll actually sit there and work. If it's electronics, they'll talk about it for a bit, and then they'll design something and work on something right on the desk. And in that course environment, we've also flipped some of the lecture material so that it's online and the students can review it in advance at their own pace. So it's a very individualized learning experience. So I was a little bit slower in one of my classes, so generally I could barely keep up with the notes, yet alone absorb it. When you, when you put some of the material into an online delivery format, people can learn at their own, their own pace. When they're here, they get a much richer learning experience because they've already absorbed some of the knowledge and we have, you know, they can go seek help from some of our tutors if they're having troubles but understanding Bill, I'd like it. to get time for one more question. All here. right. <laughs> Anyways, great, it's a great opportunity for the future. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. With all the uh, increased opportunities for access to information, also comes the opportunity to uh, distribute information that uh, may be false or misleading uh, in a purposeful way. Is this a concern and uh, <laughs> is the university training students to watch for this in any way or should we even be concerned? I, I think they all want to have a go at this yeah. one. Yeah. Leslie, why don't yeah. I start with you? So I, I think actually the two questions are related in, in a very obtuse way, but and what that is, I think the responsibility of the university is not, as, as Bill suggested, we're no longer the keepers of knowledge, but we're the um, our, our mandate is becoming the, the being able to teach our students how to understand data and understand knowledge. Um, so what, what has become really essential is that notion of critical thinking, which is sort of an old buzzword, but I, I, it really infuses itself back into technology in a way that um, is more critical than ever. 
And so being able to discern, and I see this with my own 16-year-old son as he was telling us something the other night that was completely absurd. And so you know, we asked him to, to look at the source of that data and start to think critically about what it was that he was reading. And our students are no different, as we are as well. Um, and so at the university, it's not, it really isn't where we're going to be standing on the podium pontificating anymore. It's, it's all about that experience. It's about understanding the amount of information, being able to discern what's important. Um, and so that, that notion of false information, but I'll take it one step further and then I'll, I'll stop or let my colleagues speak. Um, it's being able to understand the depth of deception that's embedded in the technology that is invisible. And so that's where our research comes into play in terms of understanding what's embedded, what's, in, what's not being seen by us, and when we hit a key, what's happening. So for example, Bill and I were sitting at a table um, at a senior leadership retreat and we were talking about work integrated learning. And we jokingly said, oh, we need like an eHarmony style um, <laughs> you know, matchmaking app for our students and for industry. Guess what the next um, Yahoo email that came into my email, an eHarmony, you know, join eHarmony, it's listening. And so, and you know, we joke around about that, but it's actually true. Wow. And so it, it's understanding the depth of embedded deception. And that is, I think, the role that the university plays in educating our students, or one of them. Uh, Mohammed. Yeah, th this, this is a great question. And coming back, now related to the industry, when you do advertisement, for example, on Google and Facebook, Facebook now is not achieving the same results because of there is there, is there a lot of fake information and news. Google is much better. So even the big companies who are working on the digital infrastructure regarding moderating this, and this is very interesting, when you open things to the max, then now try to organize it. And so this is where the digital infrastructure, also AI, everything we're talking about, is really working to make sure things are legitimate and they are good. So again, growth. On the personal level, I agree with Leslie, coming back about critical thinking and decision making, what I mentioned about the skills. Because at the end of the day, when you're exposed to a lot of information, even in your domain knowledge or generally for news or whatever, it's the decision making is coming down to the individual. Okay, this is where we go more tied to the smart society I mentioned. So I would say it's two sides, organizations, individuals that are working to make sure that there is regulation for this, and also the digital infrastructure like Yahoo, Google, Facebook. They also need to work and they are working on this to make sure also they can grow and, and also you still use them to find the information and see an ad and make money, and they're making money out of that. Bill, do you have a last quick word? No, I'm, I'm gonna pass. I think my colleagues did a great job there. <laughs> I was just amazed that nobody talked about elections and fake news, but <laughs> well, uh, I, I do think what I would add is there's a responsibility for leaders from all sectors mm -hmm. To, uh, agree. to be honest about information, even when it may not be to their uh, personal or professional benefit, that we need to be role models and we need to demand that our leaders from all parties, whatever side, are doing the same. He said he didn't have a last, but that was good. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Um, we've, we've come to just about the end here, and so I, I need to wrap up and then we have a small video to show you. It has been a distinct, pleasure and honor for me to sit here with these three folks and, and with all of you to uh, moderate this session today. And a, but a few thank yous are in order. First of all, to, to you guys um, for, for coming along in droves. We had to put more tables in. Um, and, and for the questions, they, uh, th that was really good. Thanks to the university and to the Schulitz School um, for graciously hosting this event. But mostly to the three of these guys and their insights in our digital future and, and, our, and our roles as engineers and geoscientists and just simply members of society. So thank you, Dean Leslie Riggs, Dean Bill Rosehart, and Mr. Mohammed uh, Abib, Dr. Mohammed El Habibi. Enjoy the rest of your day. Before you go, we have a short video. I think they might actually make it like attached to your brain, like with those octo arms. So then it would like, like you can just think something and it appears on the screen. Like, so then you won't have to waste your time just tap, 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 searching up things. Um, um, um.
eventually, I think people might actually be able to create like robots that are actually like acts like a human. Here I'm a Star Wars fan, and yeah. I'm on the Luke Skywalker hand, right? Um, he loses his hand after it's chopped off. They open up the prosthetic hand he's using. It. The pipes are opening and closing, and then he puts it back on and screws on, and then it just moves around. I mean, in the future, the hope is that uh, you can do that. That would be pretty cool. Right, so you lose a limb, and then you're able to reattach maybe the muscle fibers and the nerves, um, and then you're able to use it as your hands. Mm. And as I interact with the world, I hold my lightsaber or my cup of coffee. Um, I can acquire all the information uh, that would um, make me a, a worthy um, holder of the lightsaber, right? Or just not to spill my coffee. But like, imagine like a robot just extends its arm, like, that'd be pretty cool. One of my previous lab mates is trying to work on the possibility of a third arm. That'd be pretty cool. I can hold my coffee, my lightsaber, and my phone. <laughs> but we have this one rule I'm in the lab uh, where you can't create the Doc Ock um, arm because that's just evil. So <laughs> we can't go there. No more than seven, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Who knows what the future is going to have, right? Like, there could be, like, I don't know, teleporters or something.